<clears throat> okay, so um, I'm still here on our rockbyuniversity.github.io. Um, and we just covered genomics data. So we covered the types of data we're going to need, um, what types of data we're going to handle when we're starting to work with high throughput sequencing data, or if people are giving us high throughput sequencing data. So before we go any further into actual programming, starting to interact with these data types in R, one thing we can learn, which is really useful, is how we can review this data in a linear genome browser. So we're going to learn uh, IGV. So this is, I think, a lot of linear genome browsers, including things like IGB. But now we have IGV. And some of you probably know, does anyone know UCSC genome browser? So that's a really popular one. And uh, we'll talk, I'll allude to that in this slide as we go. So one weird thing about doing this particular course for me is that I need to move between the slides and IGV. Um, and whereas in R, it's easy for me to kind of break between. It's a little trickier here in this class. So forgive me as I move between the two. I usually try and present the slides and then I will show you how it works in IGV. So um, as an introduction, we're just gonna tell you what IGV is, how to get um, and run IGV. This is updated recently, so I will go to the page to show you what to do. Um, how you kind of, what is IGV's user interface? How is it kind of arranged? How we can move around the genome, make bookmarks, build gene lists um, inside IGV, so regions of interest. And then importantly, how we can actually load the data. And I'm going to make an allusion here, allusion, add allusion, to one of our own packages, track tables, which allows you to organize this information. Um, then a little bit about how we can use user supplied data, which is most useful, what you're generating. Um, and then how we can take advantage, and this is something which UCSC does very well. It has lots of external data sets available we can import lots of this data into IGV either through their systems or just go get the data directly. Um, and then finally, how we can best display and kind of control the visualization of this data inside IGV. Um, and then some little tricks at the end, some kind of cool features of IGV, which I think we can't do in UCSC. So what is IGV? It is, um, integrated genome viewer. Again, there was integrated genome browser, which wasn't so popular by, I think, Affymetrix. So this is by Broad. It is a genome browser. So it allows us to visualize genomics data, expression, chip, resequencing, multiple alignment, shRNA, really any data which can be put on a linear genome. So if we have a chromosome, a start and an end, or a chromosome and a start, we can put it on the genome. What we can't put on the genome is unaligned sequences, right? So FASTQ, where we just have the sequence, but no idea where it's been aligned to or where it can map to in the genome, we're not gonna be able to visualize those in IGV. We will need to perform an alignment. Um, and if we want big wigs, we'll need to summarize that alignment. Okay. We're gonna cover that in the first few sessions in Bioconductor. Here okay, we're gonna assume that we already have data available. And as we saw, we can go grab data from these genome repositories already. So we don't really need to make our own data. It will handle most common genomic data types. It will recognize the extension and it will be able to load them without us having to say anything or do anything. It is a Java desktop application. So you need Java. Actually, I see now if you can download it with Java kind of built in, so you don't actually need to install Java yourself. That allows you to do that now. I will show you at the end, there is also IGV is updating and it is moving to JavaScript, which is totally different from Java, it just has Java in the name. But that means it will basically run just in your browser. So it's gonna use all the clever things in HTML5 to uh, make it entirely independent of Java, just for running in your Safari, Chrome, Explorer, whatever, Steam, whatever the latest Microsoft one was, it's not Explorer. Does anyone know the Microsoft Genomics Edge? Edge browsers. It doesn't depend on a server. 
Okay, you can get additional information from a server. And I think this is the real problem with UCSC is it's based on a server and it's not our server. Um, so we don't have control over the versions in there. It also means that potentially if you want to load your own data in there, it can get a little slow. When we are uploading data to a server, the server is doing the work and sending us back stuff to visualize. This is all running locally on your computer by using things like binary indexed files, these compressed versions, computer readable versions. We're not going to need to worry so much, but it will consume memory on your computer. So the more data you load, the slower it may get. And I would like to say you'll never reach that limit, but you will if you load 30, 40 samples at a time and some additional annotation. You will save yourself a lot of hassle um, by creating binary indexed versions of your files. It will save memory, it will save CPU. So like I say, it requires Java. It's available from Broad. I think if I uh, go to the website, I can skip over this bit. Let's go to the website. Oh, oh. let's try this. So if you go there, I recommend you download IGV. Most of our, most of our exercises will produce something you can visualize in ITV as we go through this course. So we do need to download it. They used to have um, a tool set to allow us to launch it from a web browser. They actually discluded that, but we have here for every major version of operating systems, we have both uh, Mac OS, Windows, Linux, but we have the Java included um, and then Java required. So if you already have Java on your system, you don't need to download uh, this one with Java included, but I do. So one of these ones would be the good ones. If you want archived versions, which it can be important. So if for whatever reason, the data isn't displaying the way you like it, they've changed some configuration. There are archived versions. We can go back and go the software. Um, and as you can see here, you can see they're moving development to IGV.js, this kind of web app version. So hopefully once we've got it, we can launch it, double click, it will launch, and we have something like this, this IGV GUI. So if this is what the panels look like and when we start, we have really four major parts to this. We have the sample information panel. This will be here. Most of the time, this is just going to say sample name, like the actual name of the track will appear here. Um, if you start to include it from servers from IGV, or if you use our package track tables, you can add sample metadata here as well. So group information will appear here. We have our genome navigation panel, and as you can see, it's just really broken up by the chromosomes. And it's here that we can kind of select regions and it will jump to that region. So if we select a chromosome four location, it's going to jump into that location. These three and four are very similar, but they have subtly different meanings. Um, one is a data panel, and that's where your BAM, your bigwigs, really your signal data, uh, data produced from an experiment will go here. Four is very similar. I guess it's an attribute panel because it contains things like genome, genome information, so not gene information. Gene, uh, gene models, so we can see how the transcripts are assembled from chromos uh, exomes within here. When you load other GTFs or if you load annotation, that may also go into this section, which is more of an attribute than data. If I loaded a list of known enhancers, we may want to put it in. We should have, most of us should have a, a menu across the top, so from Mac, it's a little different, um, but I'm not sure we have mostly Mac here. But it separates the panel at the top. Okay. So here we have uh, IGV. We can learn a little bit about IGV. Files, this is where we load stuff in. Genomes is where we change the main genome we're on. I'm on MM10 here. But genomes here, we can load other genomes. We can remove genomes. We can load genomes for a server. So if it's not built into IGV, we can still download the faster file. 
and that will give us on our computer. And from there, it knows the sequences and the length of the chromosomes. Change, change our view preferences. We'll come to all these parts as we go along. Tracks, this really controls um, the, or, the organization of tracks in this table here. Regions allows us to create regions of interest. So if we, if we come across a region, we want to bookmark it, we can do it from here. We can also create gene lists, which can be super useful if you have four genes you know always change. You just want to review them every time. Tools, we're not going to really touch this apart from the combined data tracks, but IGV being part of the broad software ecosystem merges with some of these other tools and can be integrated into IGV. I don't do too much of this. Genome space is there, is IGV and Broad's kind of overall um, home for all their tools. We can control IGV from up here. This is our sample attribute, our navigation panel, our data panel here and our attribute panel here. Mm -hmm. so we can move around the genomes really easily in IGV. Uh, we can use cytoband selection and, and zooming. So this is our cytoband here. This is uh, the regions of the, all the chromosomes organized by their size. We can scroll so we can just move left and right, or we can selection of a region of interest if we've to find the region of interest. So I think I just move around the genome now. Let me show you that. There's a lot of stuff here, which I think is pretty obvious, but let's make sure we know. It. So I have our window here. If I want to zoom in on chromosome one, I can just select a region. It will give me that window and I can keep on zooming to a point that it's not going to give me any more actual resolution. I think, I think I can use my keyboard left and right then. So I can use that if I want to go across and I just want to scan across the window and go left and right. My keyboard, I can also drag like this if I want to by putting my mouse and selection. I can also jump to a location here. So I can use chromosome one. I think I do colon 10 to uh, 10,000. Okay. And it will take me to that location. So I can type it in too. That's actually very useful because often that's how chromosome positions are written in a paper. So you can just copy and paste from a paper. IGV is pretty clever. I don't need to put the commas in. You can often guess roughly what the format is. Really usefully is I can also pre-search gene names in there because it's loaded the gene names at the bottom. And I will often go to something like actin beta, it's a control gene. And I will assess if I have signal over that region. I've got nothing loaded now, but it will take me straight to that gene there. Again, if I type that in, I think, did it take me to action beta? So it took me to the gene, but it also gave me a little bit of a range around the gene, right? So it didn't just take me to the absolute limits. It knew to give me a bit of space. So I've got about a thousand base pairs here, maybe a hundred base pairs here. Maybe I'm maybe hundred base pairs there. We can, we're gonna show you how to control that with some other preferences as we go. First useful thing we can do in IGV is maybe bookmark a region of interest to jump back to later on. Um, these can be added in two different ways. We can either just bookmark the window we're actually looking at. So I can just say click and it'll give us a bookmark. Or I can select a region using this bookmarking tool I'm gonna to show you, and then that will bookmark that particular region. So let's give this a go. And get it there. Find a nice promoter or something. So, if I want to bookmark this whole region, I've got along the top here, I've got regions, uh, region navigator. I think if I just press add, whatever was in my window, I'll do that again. Sorry, if that was a I zoom in on here, maybe I zoom in over here at the end. And I want to, for some whatever reason, save this. I can do add, and it automatically saves the window. If you zoom out a bit, you can see it's added a red bar into the top. Okay. Should be able to double click. There you go. And I can, you know, you can have some options to work with that. One thing I want to do straight away is probably add a description. So I created my first region of interest. I 
can then also use, I think it's this tool here. So that there's a defined region of interest here. If I want to then I can select this. And I might want to select a slightly different region. So I select the start of my region and then the end of my region. And I have another thing pop up in my region list navigator. So I should be able to use this region this list navigator to also hop to the regions of interest. This is often useful if you just start going through your data and you just want to say, look, this region is going to show my boss, this region I'm going to show my collaborator. You can keep them here and you can have your search and you can also search research through your descriptions, which is actually really useful. If you've got a long list, I often make 100 regions when I'm starting to look at the data. Make some free text comments I can search. Okay. So we can see that bookmarks can be created in, in, uh, very quickly, we can add descriptions, we can search those descriptions. Um, <clears throat> and uh, we can save them and actually export them for other people. A really useful thing about this, and this is what a lot of people ask me for, is um, if I delete this region, and we get in a little bit closer, say, to the promoter, and I actually want to get the sequence underneath this, or I want to be able to maybe search that region and see if there's anywhere else in the genome which is similar. So I'm just going to select a little region here. Now I can select there, it's a little bit longer than I want. I can do the LAT sequence and the LAT is gonna go and check. I didn't get much else. Let me find a slightly more interesting sequence. The LAT is gonna go scan the genome and find if it can align that little bit of sequence which we just looked at to anywhere else in the genome. That's really useful if you're making primers. Right? So you wanna make sure this is totally unique before you start making your primer, you can select the region and just go, okay, give me a quick black, it will scan the rest of the genome, find out how unique it is for you. Oh, well, sorry, I didn't get anything. Uh, I was hoping I could get some secondary sequences there, but it looks quite unique. Well, then it gives you the basic blat output. It gives you the percent of the match, uh, mismatch, or obviously a perfect match here. And I can also jump to the location. Another useful thing here is I can copy the sequence directly from underneath there. So I can go copy sequence. And I can then put that into a blat or I can put that into my primer searching tool. Yes. Um, very quickly. I'll look what we're going to be talking about. Um, if you looked here, as I zoomed in, um, stuff started to become viewable. Right? So in this like line here, we can start to see colors as we go along. These colors represent bases. If I keep zooming in, we can start to see the green represent A. We have G, A, C, T. So this kind of color scheme allows us hopefully a slightly higher resolution to get an idea what is the sequence, but most often it's actually really useful at this resolution to see if you have repeats. Do I have a string of all the same color? Do I have strings of alternating colors? Once we do zoom in, we can also actually, and this is useful when you're working with transcriptomics because it's on the other strand going the other direction, I can get the complementary strand by just clicking this button here. And if I want to, I can show the translation. I already have it. So I can allow me to look for start stop sites here just by eye. And if I am on some weird, it's a bit slow my GB. If I am on some weird um, translational table, so at the moment we're using standard, but if I want to use the translational table of codons to proteins, amino acids, I can also choose from these here. So probably vertebrate mitochondria might be most useful. Cool. 
when you have a region of interest, when you do not have a region of interest, but a group of genes, you can use gene lists. And you can actually create gene lists from regions of interest. We can create our own gene list. And typically, like I said, especially for things like single cell, you'll have markers of particular populations and you'll want to just go look at your signal for your samples over just those genes. We can either create our own lists or IGV has built in quite a, quite a set of curated lists for various genomes. Um, and by having these gene lists, we can actually then look across multiple genes at the same time. So I guess here, the MDM genes are cell cycle, and I can show that those seem to be very well expressed. Whereas this TP53, this is another cell cycle gene, but they seem to be much less expressed. You can combine this with epigenetic marks and you can get an idea across your panel of genes, really how they're acting um, out of the box. So let's have a look at that. Uh, we have um, tracks, regions, gene lists, import regions. Tracks, tools, gene lists. Okay, so we can import gene lists and I think we just import names of genes. I can also pull or just, uh, can you make use of all these gene lists which are built in? And these include things like pathways, uh, gene ontology terms, okay terms here as well. And we can also um, hopefully create new ones from here uh, and just type in the genes we want here. Maybe I was meant to do cap. I don't know, pull them up. So now I can have my customized gene list. We have captain beta on the left and gap DH on the right. And you can see it's kind of pulled us directly over those regions. We're going to do a little bit of work in that on our exercise. But one thing which a lot of people get stuck with is once you created a gene list, or once you're using a gene list, how do you get back out of this view? I, I can paint, I can move side by side, or I can operate in these windows separately. If you ever just want to return, you can usually just hit this jump to whole genome view. It's actually a home button. And that will just hopefully, usually it will just take us to the home. I guess we can just press back there as well. Okay, so we can create, we can get IGB open, we can download it, we can create regions of interest, and we can create gene lists to kind of review over. But really, we want to start to get some data into IGB. Um, and the first thing we need to do, like I was saying, the first thing we need to do is faster a reference genome. We need to select what reference genome we're working in here on this drop down. Um, okay. So we can show you that in action. And um, if we go here, go, oh, there we go. And look good. All right, I'll keep it small. Um, you can go genomes. Oh, actually, start here. So mostly, most of your genomes should be, a lot of major genomes will be available straight away in this drop down. So things like human are often here. HG38 is the latest. HG19, HG18, uh, mouse, and then 10. We've got that there. If, we've got more. If you want to get more genomes than available by default, we can actually just, let me show that again. We can go down to the bottom of this and press more. And it gives you this whole option. Uh, all these options are things to download. If you want to download and just be able to view data without looking at the sequence, you don't need to click this button. So if you're not interested in looking at the sequence underneath your particular region, this is going to save you time and space because it takes a while to download a few gigabytes of faster file. 
But if you wanted to, you can grab whatever genome you're interested in, let's say DM6, click download sequence, and it'll go off. You can download everything you need in order to build. Open that genome, and once it's done, it'll be available here for you. If you want to do uh, your own genome entirely, so you want to build this yourself and not rely on them, we can go to this create.genome file. And actually, we need a unique identifier. So these are the required things. So the unique identifier, my unique genome. And then we just need one file, the FASTA file. So we already know what that looks like. We know we can get them from my genomes. We just need to get that file, browse your computer, tell it where it is, and it will build the genome from that. So it looks at the FASTA, that can give it chromosome lengths, and it can also get the sequences from it. That's all we need to display our data. Most of the time, you don't need to build your own genomes. If you're in the Jarvis lab and you're doing new genomes, or in the Corona lab or the Vossel lab, you might need to. Most common data formats can be loaded into IGV. And if actually you go to the IGV website, I think they've got a full list of the different data types, file formats, I guess. They, they support all of these different types of data. And those include the ones we're really interested in, BAM, BED, BED graph, BigWig, uh, BCF, we talked about math, mutation annotation format, we talked about all these are kind of covered by uh, IGP. So it does a good job of covering the major file formats. So we're really interested in these sets, BED, BAM, BigWig, maybe a few other ones like GTF. One thing which IGV does, which a lot of people don't take advantage of, and it's a little bit of a pain to set up, so I'm just going to point you to our package, really. IGV it allows for the inclusion of information on samples. So it allows you to kind of add not just sample name, but say antibody or group. Um, and this is often included then on this left-hand panel here. So it adds a, like a little heat map area where it starts to color it by different metadata information we provide. Really, this looks like um, this. So it's basically a tab, tab delimited file, telling it the name of the track, and here additional metadata information. This can be pretty much whatever the user wants to define. And then, to be honest, just a bit of a self plug here, to really get this into IGV. Um, a few years ago, I wrote a package with Sanjay, who was in my team in the UK. And this just allows you to create an HTML report containing the sample information. I think I had one. It looks a little like this. And you can just click, and it's going to open that data in IGV directly and pass over any metadata. I don't want to do that right now. I'm going to show that as we get a bit further because it takes a while to load into IGV. So if you want to build big IGV tables and metadata, I recommend looking at our package. And I'll be very help, happy to support you with that. With this metadata, it just allows you to do simpler things like sort, filter your tracks. You can filter by an antibody. You can group them by antibody um, and split them up across multiple parts. I'm going to show you this in a few, a few slides. In um, we can also load data from URL, which is kind of nice. We don't need to have the data on our computer. If we know a URL which hosts the data for us, we can do something close to the UCSC. Just needs to be an HTTP, HTTPS, or FTP. SFTP isn't supported. We should just be able to go file, load from URL, and copy and paste this. Maybe this will work. Link. File, load from file, we'll go load from URL. Oops, got no idea. It's loaded it there. I just don't think there's much data on it. I think it's a very small file deliberately so that I can load it very quickly. It did load. Yeah, but, but. 
I thought I might have just had a little bit of data on the first page. So it's just an example uh, file. You can load through that URL. Uh, cool. A nice and useful thing in a way of us demonstrating this sample information is to use this load, so load data from a server. So UCSC, as anyone who's using UCSC, it has built in just tons of databases and annotation, and you can just add this to your browser. And the importance is it gives you context to your own data. Okay? And that's, we need this in IGB. We can't have a browser without it. Um, so actually, IGV comes with this, let me just see what we're going to talk about directly, um, comes with a few tools to load data from servers. If I go here, let me see what's available for mouse. Virtual server. So not, much, not much for mouse. Let's try HG19. Because what's available is obviously dependent on your species. So here we're going to just try HG19. File, load from server. So we can see for something a little bit more like human, we have lots of annotations available for us. So we have annotations, and these include different gene models we may want to load in. We may decide that we don't trust the one which counts. Maybe we want ensemble gene models, UCSC gene models, because you've previously been looking at UCSC. We also have things on DB. SNP is available here. So if you have your, I mean, I used this the other day and very much solved the problem. We had a repeat. We wanted to find out. We had a repeat. The person I'm working with sequenced it and found a SNP. We didn't know whether it was actually a known SNP. I just loaded it into IGV. I went to the region. I clicked DB SNP um, and it loaded the SNP over that particular location. Zoom in. And then from there, I could Google the SNP. Yeah. And it's just going to send me to the actual page. And then this gives me information on that SNP. Right. So even though we don't have these built inside um, UCSC, like UCSC, they're not built in, we haven't got them on our computer yet. We just need to go file, uh, sorry, file load from server. And you'll find there's tons of useful um, information there, including some stuff from the ENCODE project. So I'm going to clear out this track. Then. Last thing we get for like human data in HG38 and HG19 is we can load data from ENCODE. Um, and IGV are updating this. You can see here I've got thousands of tracks available to me. And if I wanted to, I could probably search for my CH12. Oh, oh that was mouse. Uh, let's try Nick. So I got some ChipSeq, and I got narrow peak format. I got bigwig. Um, and I can actually click on any of this data. Let's try and load a bit of this data. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's going to take a second to load. Oh, there we go. So now you can see it's loaded. You can also see we got some sample information panel filled out as well. And that's because ENCODE have bothered to put in the sample information on their side. So now if I wanted to, I can start to use some of those tricks. So let's group tracks by cell type. So it just allows me to organize my data a little bit differently by using this tracks, group tracks, sort tracks, and using the metadata. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, like I showed you earlier on, ENCODE itself just allows us to download the big wigs, the BAM files. So if we wanted to, we could just go to ENCODE, download the files, and import them straight ourselves. The one issue with doing that is we don't get the metadata table here, the sample information, unless you use track tables to create it. OK. So IGV, most of the time, is going to give us a sensible way of displaying the data. If we give it a bed graph track, it's going to, describe, it's going to uh, plot it like a bar graph across the genome. If you give it a bed file, 
they will plot, plot them as single blocks. Usually it's going to make a, a sensible choice. You can actually have a look to see what it's going to do with different extensions from going here. And it will tell you, you know, with this type of file, I'm going to make this type of plot. Um, and simple just to show you a little bit what these look like. For bed files, we're going to load it and it's going to be, you know, we saw already it's tan delimited, chromosome start end. If it's bed six, it's going to be chromosome start end score or main score strand. But these get displayed in IGV just as blocks of regions. Right? There's no depth, it just shows you a block here. A wig, bed graph, and big wig, no matter what format you use, so if you use a wig, bed graph, or big wig, they're all going to be displayed the same way. And it's going to be displayed like this, like a signal graph across the genome, where height represents the score at that particular position. Um, again, the recommended format is big wig. If you try and load in a genome size bed graph, it's just going to become very, very slow. Big wigs, we can rapidly just look around for the regions of interest. BAM alignment files, we always need this .bai file. So if it's not in the same directory, it's not, it usually has to be uh, the same name, but with a .bai rather than a .bam. IGV will realize it's there and it will be able to load it. If it can't find this .bai file, it will just tell you, I can't find it. I'm not going to load this file. I'm going to show you how you can create these BAI files. It does a sensible choice. It gives us the coverage. So it actually calculates the depth of reads across the genome. And it shows us underneath all the reads which are aligned to that particular region. We can control this display fairly straightforward. So IGV is going to make some sensible choices for us, but we can control it through two different reasons, really. We can either control it through the view, which was at the top of the page, preferences, and then make our changes, or we can select the track and right click, and that will also give us some options. So, okay. so I'm just going to go through the important options here. So here, if I just can I open this up, here? So if I go for view, okay, preferences here. First off, we have the general um, display all tracks in a single panel. Feature flanking window is kind of useful. So I was saying earlier on, if I jump to a, um, say, act and beta, the distance around, I believe, is controlled by that feature flanking window. So if I made that much bigger, I saved it. It should give me a much bigger window when I go back to Active Beta. So now I get a much bigger window around Active Beta. It's giving me now 10,000. That's really useful for when you're doing these multi panel gene things, because sometimes you want to look a little bit around to see if there's transcription factor binding sites. So put that back onto 100. Yep, okay. The other thing which is, I'm going to save that, sorry. And then we have tracks, and we can control things like the actual height of our tracks and we're displaying. Um, really useful one, though, is alignments, because IGV is actually doing a little bit of changes to the way it displays your alignments. And one which is often automatically put on is down sample reads. So this really confuses people because um, they go and they count the number of reads in their window and it doesn't actually match up to what they see in their data. And it's because IGV just sets a limit. It doesn't want to try and fit in. If you've gone really deep, it's not going to put a million reads in that window. It's going to filter it and it's going to filter it here down to 100 reads okay, just for display. But if you're trusting that IGV is showing you exactly what's in your BAM file, it isn't unless you change this, unless you modify this. Um, when you load a BAM file, it gives you some options. So it's going to show you both the alignment track, so these are the actual reads. It's going to show you the coverage track. So if I can, let me show you this actually. Um, uh, it's going to show you, I'll show you in a second. It's going to show you the coverage track, which is the depth of reads. 
And if we get into things like RNA-seq, it's going to show you when a read jumps from one exon to another. And it's going to give you the depth of reads doing that. So it does a lot of work there. And we might want to turn off some of these if we're just not interested in looking at the data that way. I just want to look at the BAM file reads. I don't care about the depth. I don't care about the jump. Another one which um, tricks people is filter duplicate reads. So often reads which land at exactly the same position on a genome. So if you have two reads which are identical, due to the probability of that happening by chance, it's very unlikely. Usually we could say it's a PCR error. Right? It's because a PCR is over-amplified and this has just been sequenced multiple times. The fact is that isn't true with the present day sequencing because we can go super deep. And if you're in a very small genome, you expect to see duplicate reads. If you've done targeted sequencing, you're just sequencing your panel of genes you expect to have mutations in, you're going to have duplicate reads. It's just a matter of number of reads versus space you're looking at. It's just probability. So unclicking that will help. Otherwise, it's going to filter any reads which are duplicate. And again, you're going to look at this and think, I'm missing something. Okay. Finally, the one thing which you know, you can decide whether or not you want to crash your computer is the visibility range. So I am going to stop this for a second. File a new session. So I downloaded the um, I downloaded the BAM file from that ENCO page we ended up on earlier. So I'm just going to load that file. Load from file. You see, I've got the big way. I got the BI file right next to it. So here's the BAM file. We've got dot band dot by with the index. Okay. So if I look at that now, I can't see anything. There's no signal. If I loaded a big wig, um, I can see signal. Right. And that's because big wigs are actually super clever. And you can get really very good statistics of bins. Band files is not going to do this for us. Right. So if I start zooming in. I still don't see any information on the BAM file. I still don't see any reads. I still don't see any reads. I'm getting pretty close now. Now it's starting to show me reads. So let's go to Act in Beta. You know, here I have some reads over here. Okay. So if I zoom out a bit, zoom out quite a bit, okay. then it just disappears and it says zoom in to get that cut. This is controlled, and I often set this quite high. But this is controlled from the last thing we want to look at in preferences, which is visibility track threshold. So I think by default, that's like 10 or 30. I've set it to 1,000 because when you're looking at RNA-seq, I want to see this read starts aligning in this exon and finishes aligning in this other exon. It's evidence of splicing. So you can modify that yourself. I do warn you, changing this to this level, I've got a very powerful laptop. This does slow your computer because it's displaying way more information than you really need. So you don't need to necessarily mess with that. I'm just going to load in that last thing we haven't loaded yet. So it's going to load in this bed file. So you can see bed files look very boring in IGV. But you can see what they represent. And I've got a bunch of which I'm not going to mess with that. But here we can see we have lots of reads. This has all come from the same data. Lots of reads here, right? lots of reads have aligned. If I, I'm going to auto scale this in a second, I can uh, maybe set the data range for now. Um, zero. So there is also the big wig should represent the BAM file because it's basically turning this into here just signal per base pair. And then we can see underneath that we have in the bed a peak. So that's meant to be where our transcription factors bind. We don't know how they've gone from BAM to bigwig to bed, but the BAM has all the information on the reads. We can actually extract the coverage from that. The bigwig just has the information on the coverage. And the bed file, the most simple of them lot, it only has the region where it believes the peak was. So that's where it believed Nick was binding. 
I haven't had to specify how to display them. IGV just knew once I loaded a big rig, it looks like that, the bed looks like that. We can also control things like, and I'll show some of this again. We can control things like the color of the tracks. And this could be useful if you have three different types of epigenetic mark. Maybe you want to color one red because it means go. Green means go. Red means stop, say. So active marks, you might want to color green. We can change the graph type as well. So by default, we have some options. It's a bar chart. So this is what it, what it calls a bar chart. You might want to make a points plot or a line plot. It's basically a points is just a dot, so line is without color underneath. Sometimes a heat map can be very useful as well. So you can have like uh, lots of signal here, a gap, and lots of signal here. We can control the data range of the window. So in, for things like Bigwig, you know, uh, let me do set data range. I'll set that to 30, no, oh, I'm sorry, 200. Okay. So then I can set the data range, the range of this window. But as I pan along, you know, things that are too small, I'll need to reset the data range to really see them. Right? We have a nice little trick inside IGV called auto scaling. Okay, and what auto scaling does is if I tell a track to auto scale, it's going to tell me the range of the data here, right? so I know what the actual range is, but it's going to try and fit the data to the actual window. Right? So if this is the maximum value, when I'm just looking at this tiny region, it changes the data scale so that you know, the, it goes up to the maximum or just above the maximum of this peak. As soon as I zoom out and there's a bigger peak next to it, it's going to rescale that window, and then it's going to be look smaller. Okay? You can see this in action. I'll just do uh, auto scale now. Okay. These look big. I need to show the data range. Hang on. Zero to 20. And as I zoom out, my data range went from zero to 162 because this is now the biggest thing. Right. So that's nice in a way because you can kind of zoom along and see the shape of your data. If you're not too worried about it, you can still get the height here. But these are still meaningful peaks. It's just the other one was that much bigger. Right, so I still want to be able to see the shape. The next thing which is really useful is, you know, if you're going to do auto scaling, maybe I come to that. If you're going to do auto scaling, you can actually do group auto scaling too. So if I've already normalized samples to be, um, I haven't got more than one sample. Yeah. I'm going to have to go to HG19 quickly. But if you have two samples, you know that they should be within the same range. They've been normalized the same way. So should have more big wigs prepared. Um, big wig. Let's just see if I've got some big wigs. Um, big wig. Um, big wig. Okay. That's going to take a second to load. Okay. Okay. Right. So I can now do right click them and I do group auto scale. It's going to make sure that the data range is consistent across the samples I look at. But as I move along, it's going to rescale them depending on the biggest uh, value in both these windows. I move along a little bit, you can see this one's now going to get much higher. Group auto scale is really useful just for comparing. You know, this is group A versus group B, and I want to see how the signal changes between the groups. Good. That's the main features of IGV. There's got a few other cool things which IGV can do. One thing which IGV is super, I find super useful is IGV can actually display splicing. And we're going to see this in the exercise, so I don't think I need to show you. But as well, like previously, we'd seen it has coverage. And here you can see the coverage across exons. We also have the reads here. What IGV will also do is report when you have multiple reads spanning from one exon to another, it's going to report how many reads were actually supporting that splice junction. So this isn't by originally from IGV. This is actually called a Shishimi plot. 
things like this. I think it's a, there's a program called MISO, which does RNA-seq analysis, and they make sashimi plots. So we can actually view that in real time with our BAM file, and we can see how these splice sites exist. I mean, clearly here, there's a, there's a change from this exon used to this exon used. So there's an alternative transcript usage here. And we can also then use this more formalized Shishimi plot. And this gives you not only like the actual size of the uh, splices, but this also allocates how many reads supported that particular splice. So if you have multiple samples, you can say, okay, 2,000 reads supported the splice in this sample, only 10 in the other sample, there's a splice and change going on. A really useful feature of IGV is overlay tracks. So if I have two things I want to overlay, maybe I don't want to average them, I actually want to see them side by side, I can left click, or right click them, and I can go overlay tracks. First thing to do is change the color first. So I'm going to change this to be red, or we'll change this one to be green. And then I can create an overlay track. Oops. If I zoom in, you know, at least you can see which portion of the track is from one over the other. So in this case, you can start to put multiple tracks on top of each other and start to see not just how consistent they are, but I guess where they differ. So that's a bit of a consistent area here. You can see the red. This is really useful when you have opposing marks. You have an active chromatin mark and a suppressive chromatin mark. You can overlay them and get more things. Last cool, last thing is actually um, something IGV, I believe, stole from uh, industry. There's a really cool tool, CLC Workbench. I'm not sure if anyone uses that. It's like a, it's a pay analysis tool. So CLC Workbench allows you to do something called track calculus. And IGV allows you to do something similar where you can use it. You can kind of combine data tracks by either adding them together, summarizing them, timesing them together, dividing one by the other. And I can show you how to do that here. So let's, let's, if I want to de-overlay these, how do I do that? Separate tracks. Okay. So now if I select these two, I go tools, combine data tracks. And I have an option for how the tracks are. So I'm going to select that first one, select the second one. In this case, I only have a few options, but I might want to divide one by the other. One over other. Right, and then I can have my resultant track here, and I can use that track just as I would. The really useful thing is when you're doing chip seek and you have your chip and your input doing this kind of subtraction in IGV, it allows you to see when do I see enrichment over random. So it's a neat, it's a neat little trick which IGV's added reasonably recently. Okay, final thing uh, in terms of the tools um, is IGV tools. So I've I've mentioned Bigwig, I've mentioned BegGraph. IGV has its own format called TDF. The problem with TDF is tiled data format. And it basically displays like a Bigwig. The problem with TDF is that no one else supports it. It is only used in IGV. And as I show you later on, bigwigs we can import into R, you can import into Python. There are wonderful C++ libraries to deal with it. TDF, and I've really tried to look at this, barely has any library supporting it, even in like very deep Java. You'd have to write Java to start to, to mess with TDFs. So it's not necessarily that useful, but if you don't want to make big wigs and you never want to step into any programming, IGV tools actually allows you to make these types of tracks straight from a BAM file. Just need to go run I oh, tools, run IGV tools. And it has a few different options, count, sort. Index is a useful one. If we've got our BAM file and we need to index it, actually do it inside IGV. We just need to provide the file. In this case, if I want to turn a TDF, I want to create a TDF, I can select my BAM file. Oops. 
um, to let the genome, I guess, the zoom levels, how much resolution do I need? And then I can go off and run that. I can tell you this is going to take a while, but at least you don't have to learn a new program. You can kind of do this now. And then index to give it the bound file is super useful. I'm not going to. Okay. So the last thing to look at then is just what can you do once you've got this um, image? Um, really, you want to be able to take these things apart inside your Illustrator like tools, your Photoshop. So you should be able to go file uh, save image. And then we can select from here SVG. So usually SVG is the one which is easier, easiest for us to mess with an illustrator. And so if you save that there, we'll then save the session. And then you can change the colors of the tracks. You can remove the data points, et cetera. Remove the data scales here and just customize it a little bit more yourself. I say Inkscape because I think that's the free one. Finally, if you have enough of IGV, but you do want to come back to it later, similar to that we can save workspaces, we can also save sessions. So if we save the session, call it you know, my session. It's going to save an XML file, and that XML file just contains how I've colored it, how I've grouped it, where the data is on my computer, and then I can just come back, load that session later on, and I'm ready to go. Um, and that's also something you can share with your PI, especially if you're using external data. You send them the XML, and they can see the data the same way. So I think that's the end of the session today. I believe I did have some exercises um, for this. So if you just give me a second, it's not LinkedIn. Let me go dig those out. I'm going to pause the recording.